Hey everybody, how is it going today? This is not a video that I usually make, but I want to talk about why the M2 MacBook Air may very well be a traveling video maker's perfect laptop. We're going to talk about the size, the speakers, and the general performance of this machine. Let's get into the size and weight of it for just a moment. The M2 MacBook Air that's going to come out next month is about three quarters of a pound lighter than the MacBook Pro 14 inch model. In every dimension, it's smaller, from one fifth to one third of an inch thinner all the way around. Yet, Apple managed to fit 96% of the screen size into this thinner, lighter chassis. I think that's going to be big. That three quarters of a pound is the difference between carrying that extra lens with you or choosing to travel a little bit lighter in a way that you genuinely will feel it, especially when we're talking about weight limits for airliners and things like that. What about the speakers? Well, the speakers are confirmed now on the website to have two thin woofers as part of that four speaker array. But this carries for the first time in a MacBook Air, the spatial audio designation. That means it's going to sound very good and be one of the best, if not the best sounding laptops in its class. So compared to the six that are in the 14 inch M1 MacBook Pro, you're going to be looking at six total speakers, two force canceling woofers, or four total speakers with two thin woofers. Max volume and bass will surely be different, but it's going to sound amazing for what it is. In my case, I do have the 14 inch MacBook Pro with the M1 Pro chip. I love the speakers, but I still want to edit off of external monitors or my headphones. So either one of these would be great, especially if you're using uh, different external speakers and headphones anyway. Now I think where we need to take a little bit of time is talking about the performance. It's natural to be worried. Is my current device going to be out of date, especially if I have the 14 inch M1 Pro MacBook Pro? Well, the M2 has faster cores, 18% faster, they said in the keynote. The M1 Pro, though, has double the high performance cores. So when you're talking four high performance cores versus eight, obviously the M1 Pro in multi-core performance is going to win. But the M2 is going to naturally outshine the older regular M1. But the M2 has 25% more GPU cores than before. And it, those cores, because of the larger power envelope and the optimization, can actually give up to 35% faster performance. That starts to close the gap of the M1 Pro having 40% more cores than the M2 in the GPU area. There's not the same power optimizations in the M1 Pro. They're just throwing the energy at those uh, extra cores. But the gap is starting to close. And the M2 MacBook Air GPU actually has 71.72% less pixels to push than the M1 Pro. That does result in a 224 PPI versus a 254 PPI on the M1 Pro 14-inch MacBook Pro. But having less pixels to push, 29%, 28% less pixels, is going to again help close that gap of the 35% faster GPU despite the 40% more cores in the M1 Pro. Now, if you're worried about the PPI for a moment, don't worry. The Studio Display and the Pro Display XDR are 218 PPI. You may very well only have a few inches of difference in how far those screens are from you. And the M1 iMac is 219 PPI. Almost all of us put these displays around an armless length away from us, and that's naturally where this laptop is going to sit. So I don't think that we're going to notice much of a difference between the 14 inch and the 13.6 inch display. Where we may notice a difference is of course outdoor brightness with the thousand nit HDR brightness of the liquid display XDR on the 14 inch model. 1600 nits peak brightness, but it can't really sustain that for long periods of time. Of course there's 120 Hertz refresh rate, but when we're in our editing application, that refresh might not matter much to us anyway. But what do you get that's the same? Well, you get the same 500 nit SDR brightness, HDR10 compatibility, HLG support, so you can do native HDR editing in your timeline. I already have an external HDR monitor myself, so if you're going to master an HDR and you need a little bit more brightness, you may already be equipped for that. 
The 14 inch display is also the same when it comes to the number of colors it can display to the new M2 MacBook Air. They're both 1.07 billion colors, that's 10 bits. So your 10 bit files that come out of your camera are going to look incredible on either display. And when you color grade, you can trust that when it starts cutting out uh, and you start getting banding or other issues, that that wouldn't have mattered which machine you're on because you're 10 bits on both of those displays. But what about the unified memory? You can't help but notice that you get 24 gigs max on the M2 MacBook Air, and for the M1 Pro chip, it's capped at 32 gigabytes of unified memory. 24 gigabytes will likely be a sweet spot for many traveling video editors and content creators. 32 gigabytes can absolutely be used uh, in more intensive workflows, but the test conditions for each machine showed interesting results. You have to go down to the footnotes of the website. So on footnote number four for the 14 inch page, it says that with their 10 core M1 Pro with 16 GPU cores, 32 gigs of RAM, and their fastest SSD, the eight terabyte, they got 20 streams of picture in picture 422 video at 30 frames per second. Footnote five says that they get five 8K streams. Now both the M2 MacBook Air and the M2 MacBook Pro in their footnotes say that their 24 gig of RAM model with eight core CPU, 10 core GPU is getting the same 20 streams of ProRes 422 footage at 30 frames per second, 4K resolution. You do lose out on one 8K stream though. You go down from five to four, but again, these machines are so similar for $700 of difference between them. And of course, what's influencing that isn't the CPU, it isn't the GPU, it isn't the unified memory. It is the media encoder that is in there now. Now you have HEVC, H.265, H.264, and ProRes native encode and decode because of this media engine. So in summary, what a $700 extra get you for the 14.2 inch M1 Pro MacBook Pro. You get double the memory bandwidth. There's benefits. That enables the SD card slot and a third Thunderbolt uh, port to be available. That also means that those Thunderbolt ports can carry the Thunderbolt 4 rating to uh, have extra monitors supported. You get two extra tweeters. So now you have four tweeters and two woofers instead of two tweeters and two woofers. That helps the sound system to be fuller sound better, probably be even louder and have more bass. You get a larger battery, about 20 extra watt hours. However, your battery life doesn't necessarily improve. You get a UHS-2 SDXC slot, which is going to give you well over 300 megabytes of read speeds and, and write speeds. But are those four or five extra features that you're getting, in addition to the Liquid Display Retina XDR, worth $20 extra a month over three years or $30 extra a month over two years? How long will you keep this laptop? By the time that it won't serve you, are you just going to need a way bigger and better machine anyway? Will you need to step up to whatever the 16 inch M2 or M3 Max or Ultra machine will be down the road? It's going to depend on your workflow, what you anticipate you'll do in the next two to three years. But I hope that this video was helpful. Go ahead and subscribe if you want to see more content. Like this video if it was educational and something that uh, interested you. Thanks for watching. Until next time.